There are so many different lures from different countries across the world, but in the bass fishing market, whenever a new Japanese lure hits the market, it seems like it's all the rage. We have seen some extremely unique, one-of-a-kind type lures that come from Japan. And in today's video, we're gonna have on one of the best Japanese lure designers and professional anglers on the planet. And we're not just talking about finesse techniques. In this video, we're gonna talk about using giant square bill crankbaits, even bigger swim Bait, frogs that have chicken feathers, finesse plastics that you fish with 20 pound fluorocarbon, and a whole lot more. So stay tuned. It's going to be a good one. Welcome back to the Bass Juice podcast here with myself, Tyler Berger, and my best friend, CJ Schaefer. How's it going, CJ? It's good, man. Uh, I'm super excited for this one. Uh, when you came with me with the idea of doing a podcast we're going to get the special guest on this was one of the guests i said we have to have on and i think it's uh his career has been so vast not just in professional angling but with lure design and also his story is phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, so let's dig right in we've got kenta kimira from japan bassmaster elite series professional uh, bassmaster opens angler Let's go. One of the biggest things that I think that both of us were really intrigued um, with you as a person is just your whole lure making. Um, you're, you know, you've been an in integral part in a, a lot of uh, major manufacturers lure designing. And some guys may not know that. Some guys probably do know that. Um, but one thing that I really just wanted to know is how did you get started? How, how, did, how did the whole lure design process, how did you get started in that? Uh, basically, I started with just carving wood when I was kids because, you know, kind of like everybody else, I didn't have the money to buy an expensive fancy bait. So I just started carving wood by myself and, you know, that's how I really get it started. And, uh, you know, before I, that was happened before I started doing the professional fishing. So, you know, I, that, that's really, I'm not, I was not the tournament fisherman like that, like everybody else. I just started with designing bait and, you know, that's how I became famous over in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know that you've been just a huge part of, especially depths. Uh, that's the one thing that we're going to talk a lot about yeah. tonight is, you know, the depths and, and what you've designed and, and, and why you've designed them. Um, but I just think it's it's so cool, and I know that Depths is a huge brand. It seems to be getting bigger here in the U.S., um, but I know it's it's probably, what, the biggest brand over in Japan? Is that correct? Yeah, pretty much, and, you know, especially where I'm from. I'm from Lake Biwa. That's where I used to guiding, and I, that's where I grew up, and the, the Depths is from there, so, you know, we just fucked up naturally. In the first, I started to work with them. I, they didn't have a, they only had one the frog, which they call the basilisky, mm -hmm. it once got the like a little kicking tail on the back, and you know, it, I, it, that's a really great frog to fish with. But I also wanted to have some walking frog and a popping frog. And the back then, we had a hydroelectric everywhere in the whole lake, you know, Lake Biwa. And you know, I figured, you know, I had a little bit of experience about the frog because I learned some frog fishing here in the United States and a long time ago. So, you know, I kind of figured, you know, I can design my own. And, you know, that's how I started off to deal with depths. And, uh, you know, the Sreza K and the Buster K, which is a, both of the depths frog, I designed those from the, uh, I think, I, I thought it, I started with carving wood and making with padding and stuff. It's not the kind of old school way to design them, but we didn't use any like computer graphic or stuff like that. We just basically just a copying wood by my hand. That's, that's what a production is. So, you know, when I had a fingernail print or fingerprint, whatever on the bait, everything on the product. So, you know, I had to pay attention on it. Interesting. So did you, it's, it sounds like, you got connected with depths through designing this frog and you actually hand carved yep. a, a frog body gave it to depths and they were able to develop it into a hollow a hollow belly um and is that is is that frog yep. does it have the feathers coming out or it's the kicking tail 
Uh, or it, it's got the fraser tail, the okay. most of them is. And I started the design with the uh, lover tail like everything else, but I couldn't make a cast right. That's why, you know, I tried uh, several different materials and stuff. You know, with action-wise, actually, the uh, just regular feather, like a chicken feather works best, but I couldn't make cast right, and I tried uh, several different material for it. And the one that loves it, Love it, Zonku, or love it here, or whatever it is. That that was a, definitely the best material for the vlog. So, I figured since I figured that out, I you know I could have just a change the balance of weight, balance of weight, or even you know I could have put put could be able to put them in the uh, steel weight to make it a weight moving system. So yeah, it took me a little while to figure them out, but that's that's the still only vlog I've been storing it anyway. Anyway, I'm going here in the United States or either in Japan or back in home and pond and everywhere. Now, the thing that I think is really intriguing about lure making is that, or designing, is that it seems like, you know, you look at so many of the, the major brands out there and everything is almost a copy of each other. You know, it, there might be slight differences in modifications, but when you look at a lot of the lures that you have designed, there are like really big changes in them, which I know come from your brain, which is really interesting. For example, you were just talking about the frog, and I know with most m most frogs, you will notice that the weight of that frog is really in like the butt of the frog. It's kind of where that hook comes out. And in the frog that you're talking about, the depths frog, that weight is actually kind of more almost on the belly of the frog, which is just super different. So th with that being said, what was, what was the thought process behind kind of having that weight that's almost on the belly of the frog? Okay, wait, the reason why I did it, because I was one of the smaller profile, but I also wanted to push as much, as, much more water because if you got a tail weight like that, it's like a stand heavy bass boat. You can turn easy, but you don't push as much as water compared to flat flow. So I just trying to make it, you know, a little more weight in the middle. Mm -hmm. But but problem is you you won't be able to make a you know good cast compared to back weight. Mm -hmm. No, that 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 makes sense. Um, I, I guess the, the other big question kind of off of that is why did you want it to push more water? You kept, you kept saying that pushing more water, was that like something that you thought the bass would be more attracted to or? Yeah, for sure. Because a lot of the, uh, the tail weight frog is designed for snakehead over in Japan. That's all they come from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, like a snakehead has eyeball or right in the top of their head, but bass is kind of like human, you know, just right in the middle. So they can't. They don't have much as sensitivity at the surface compared to other species. So, mm, you, you know, you I almost see. have to either rattle or popping sound or slapping the water, something to let them find them, even if they're on a feeding mood. So that that's just my opinion. Sure. I've noticed a, a lot in looking into kind of the Japanese baits and their design process has a lot to do more with the water displacement how the bait displaces the water more than the sound uh, i think vibration is important but more than anything it's how does that bait displace water yeah. and that could be from you know just a little three inch minnow type bait all the way up to a, a giant floating worm to a, a big uh, this is the sakamata shad i think it's the eight incher and i think feel like it's more how does it displace the water and that's so interesting kenta because you were talking about the bass's eyesight mm. and how you know maybe they need to be able to feel the bait more than actually see it and that would probably be through their lateral line which is the line that runs horizontal uh from their body is that true is it is water displacement more important than anything when it comes to lure design? Of course, it's just a little depends on the condition. You know, it has a little clear water and you're walking really slow. You still have to go like a smaller line. But about the frog fishing, you're around the cover. So, you know, and the other thing is frog is usually, you know, you're casting against the pads or something frogging vegetation material. So, you know, 
like top water is still hard to see for bass, but even a frog, they can, they're almost invisible for the bass. That's why, you know, you have to push the water so hard. And a lot of time, the lake condition is not that slick either. You know, it has a little bit breeze. It's even less action for fish. So, you know, the pushing water is the whole key for me for frog fishing. That's super, super, super interesting. But it makes sense because if you're pushing water, like you're going to also have that like bigger wake, you know, like that you can visually see. Mm -hmm. And like he was saying, like, that's what the bass might also pick up on because of their eyesight. They're not always not always seeing right directly above them. So that's that is really cool to me. This video is brought to you by the Deep Dive app. This is an app that you can download on your phone that helps you define bass on your local bodies of water a lot quicker. Once you download this app, you can actually select the lake that you are fishing, and then you can input data like water temperature, water clarity, whether you are fishing around vegetation or if you are fishing in a windy or protected area. Once you input all this information, the app will actually spit out lures, techniques and areas that you can go on your local body of water to catch bass. This app is backed by hundreds of different tournament results from across the nation and can be extremely accurate. So if you guys would like to help support the Bass Fishing HQ channel and allow me to bring more videos like this to you, hit that link down below and download the Deep Dive app today. Now did you, uh, uh, I know that one of the the, the, the baits that you made over uh, in depth or or at least designed was um, the whole Evoke uh, series of crankbaits. And this one to yep. me, again, was really, really interesting um, because in my mind, it's one of those baits, like a square bill you think is a square bill, right? Like they're all, they're all the same, right? Well, no, they're not all the same. And I thought, I actually know kind of the, the thought process behind the Evoke series, but I would really like you to explain it as to why you kind of designed that, that square bill the way that you did, because I find this fairly fascinating. The number one reason I started to design the Evoke, because I, I used to be a big fan of the, the balsa square bill crankbait. That's all I used to use it. But only thing I don't like about is what, you know, they're only good in the world. You know, one of a four or could be one of a ten. So okay, here's one one of my favorite one in my boxes. But can you can you be able to cast against the you know butt dock or yeah. something nasty spot? If that's only one, you can't. And I couldn't. That's why you know I start you know I started thinking you know I might be able to design one with a plastic because you know you can replace any time. You can just buy another one. And it's still same action. So what I tried is, uh, I mean, the, everybody used to be just a kind of copy the shape of the wood crankbait and making a plastic mold. But I kind of redesigned it and everything because the, the diff, biggest difference in between the wood material and the injection mold is the plastic has more thicker shell around it. And it's a solid air in the inside, right? With wood material, it's more like the wood material in the, in the metal, which is a little heavier than wood, but they have a thinner shell, which is just a paint. That makes a whole difference in the world of the buoyancy and the weight balance. So, you know, where I started is just to cut every wasteful meat of the outside body of the Evo. So, you know, like, I figured, you know, I didn't need some part. When you cut it, the head part off, it gives, you know, more, more water straight to the body. And, you know, you can also have a more, the buoyancy on the, closer to the tail side. And it also has to have the weight on a little deeper bottom, you know, trying to make it the buoyancy and the, the the weight, as far as I can, on the small profile body. That's why it looks like, you know, almost looks like bullfish, you know, like a little short, but kind of yeah. looking. But, you know, I, I tried a several different ways to make it, you know, even even since I was kids, you know, I had to make a little skinny profile or either, you know, almost flat profile or any different profile. But, you know, the evil profile is one of the, that profile I was kind of 
you know, really, could, I could imagine I might be able to make a better crime bait than Bowser. Or, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, Evoke is better than Bowser or the crank bait, but I can say, you know, it's a consistent and yeah. you can replace anytime, kind of like you're a good crank bait. So, really, honestly, that's the only square bill I'm strong and anywhere I'm going in the world. Kind of like frogs too, you know, because I designed it, I know what the speed is best to, to do it, and what they can do, what they cannot. So you know, I just you know, literally don't want to change anything. That's that's a, definitely my walking tool. Right. So the the depths of Vogue uh, series of square bill crankbaits have all the characteristics of like your old school balsa bait, uh, but molded into a durable plastic shell. It's interesting that you said you focused on getting the buoyancy in the tail of the bait, which would help it back up out of cover so it doesn't get snagged. But you've got the weight in the front of the bait yeah. for the diving action. That oh, that's super cool. Because you know, like yeah. last time, last tournament I fished at the Elite Series, that was a Savine. I went up all the way to the, the you know town of Walmart, which honestly the bottom of the river was kind of nasty you know had a clothes or somebody's pants everywhere so you know <laughs> lady couldn't fish with just one crankbait all, all day long you know i honestly lost about 10 crankbait each day but you know i could still you know had enough crank good crankbait to keep fishing so that yeah, makes a lot of difference on the way you fish no i th- that is that is really interesting to me and like he said like when you do listen to like some of the best guys that you would consider like a square bill guy, they, they do talk a lot about balsa, but they say the exact same thing that Kenta said. They say sometimes you might have to buy five, six, seven, ten different baits in order to get that one bait that swims right. And like Kenta just said, you know, you, that might be $250 worth of crankbaits to get that one bait. So if you now put that, you know, same characteristics into a plastic bait that's consistent every single time, you know, you 10 out of 10 are going to be good baits or they're at least going to be consistent baits. So I really like that that you did that with that. Now, one thing that I haven't gotten into too much is fishing a big square bill. You know, like, for instance, Strike King has like an 8.0. I know that the Evoke series, I believe, has a 4.0, which is it's a big bodied, Mm -hmm. really big crankbait. And that's just something, you know, being from Ohio, we have a lot of pound, two pound fish. It's just something that I really haven't gotten into, but I would love to hear kind of your take on that square bill. Um, Cause I know that at one point in time, you were really catching them on Biwa uh, really good with that crankbait. Um, but I would just like to know kind of when, when do you pick up a big crankbait like that? When, when do you see a condition and you're like, man, this calls for a big square bill crankbait? Okay, the reason why I designed it in the first, you know, we had a big time with a big magnum of square bill in the back in, I would say 2015 or 20, between 2015 and 2017 in Lake Biwa. I mean, I could catch like over 30 almost every day straight, 250 days in a year. And that what I figured is we used to have a bunch of bluegill and also the lot of the big fish was been eating little tiny bass too oh. and you know but everybody also saw them like a big swim bait or like like tiny crash and type of stuff bait but to me the reason why i like the bigger profile square bill because it's a it's a still big big bait but you can also burn that thing you know you can reel as fast as you want and you cannot do that was a big swim bait. You know, any, any of the mm. swim bait is only for dead throw or medium retrieve. So, you know, I didn't realize that makes it that much different between the, you know, retrieving speed. So the big key for the, the magnum square bill to me is you can, you can burn as fast as you want. So, you know, that's a, that's a big key for that, that way to fish. And, uh, you know, all, that I had a really good pattern figured out once in the Grand Lake. The reason why I picked up the uh, the big square bell, even four point because I in the practice I I caught one about ten 
or a pound and a half or a pound of fish. I hook one, and you know, I was trying to shake them off on the side of the boat. And then I saw the four pounder was coming up and tried to eat that fish. So I figured that was the same type of situation as like Biwa was. So that's how I had a. I was leaning and they were always put 20 plus pound on the four was just a big crankbait. So what what kind of tackle are you using for the evoke? What kind of rod, line, reel for the, the big one? I Well, I guess we could go all the way, you know, from the evoke 2.0 to the 4.0. To me, the rod is not the really big key on it, but about the, the gear ratio of reel is a big key because I gave the, some of my big square bait onto my friend oh. and let him use it. But he said, he told me, how do, how do you even keep reeling with you? You know, he's a bigger guy than I am, but he can keep doing it. And he showed me his reel that was like 7.2 by 1, and I was using 5.8 by 1. Mm. That makes a big difference. You know, when you want, you know, when you have to reeling that fast, you, you almost have to have the roll gear ratio reel. And about the line was, you don't have to go any smaller than 20 pound test because you're burning that bait and you're grinding the rock or either wood or anything, any of the nice stuff. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it doesn't matter what, how big line you're using. So I'll be comfortable with 20 or at least 20 pound test. Yeah, it, it's coming so fast that the fish can't even see the line, feel the line. It's just a big profile bait. Just whoosh. Yeah. Fish have to react. Yeah. yeah. No, I know that. Uh, that's something I feel like we should pick up because I know that there's a few lakes even by us where bass will eat like crappie, where they'll eat big crappie. And I like in my mind, when yep. you were talking about them eating the little bass, to me, it's just like, well, I bet those big crappie, it's the same thing. I bet if you could get a, a one of those big bass to eat that, uh, if they're eating big crappie, why wouldn't they eat that big 4.0 big yep. crankbait? And to me, another key is it has to be a pressured up lake. Like the lake is kind of fresh, like some place in the up nose, you know, they are still hitting regular crankbait. You know, you don't have to walk in that hard to catch them on. But if you go down south, you know, people have a big tournament every weekend at the Grand Lake or some place like that. Japan the same way, you know. If they them fishes get used to it as any old bait we are on, they they all know what kind of crank bait we are on or what kind of swim bait we are on. So that's another reason that I want to burn it faster because they can't. We don't give it enough time to let them let them see it. So where the where I explain to people the difference in between the like a little regular profile crank bait and a bigger profile. It's like, a, you know, between yeah. the difference in between that, just a $1 bill versus $100 bill. You know what I mean? It's like they they know both of them are fake, but it hits a bigger profile, which is like $100 bill for us. We kind of know the fake, but we want to make sure that's how it works. You know, we may gonna touch it and pick up and make sure it's not the real if it's a dollar bill you know we don't care that's the same way for me so that, that that's why i'm saying that you know especially pressure up leg because of, they already know what we're doing interesting that makes sense yeah. that makes sense. i wouldn't have thought about it like that but it that makes sense the way that you said it yeah. like if it's a if, if a if a fake hundred dollar bill hit right there like you'd pick it up and you'd examine it and you'd you'd make sure that it was fake. But if it was a $1 bill, even if it was real $1 bill, you probably wouldn't even, you'd be like, okay, whatever. So what he's saying is that because it's a bigger profile, it has a bigger draw, like a $100 bill does to a human. And so therefore the fish, they almost have to just inspect it. They have to take a look. Interesting. Yeah, try it out. It's like uh, those money grab machines that you go in and there's hundreds of one dollar bills floating around but if you can key in on that one hundred dollar bill all the other one dollar bills just disappear yeah and you're just focused on that one which is the bigger bill bigger bait yeah that's an awesome analogy that is that, that is, is that's super smart yep. okay so what 
did you design any specific baits for Berkeley, Japan? Yes, I do. And the, one of the bait, I mean, I actually designed it for Berkeley, Japan, which they did not sell here in the United States, but I designed probably at least six or seven different baits. And uh, one of them, one of a unique shape one was a Jagger Locket. That's the one I caught them in online last year. It's like a little, little bug type of looking bait. It's only like 3.5 inches, but you can go with a bait caster and it's got a bunch of legs come with it. That's another way. I mean, to me, that's a big trick for the small mass fishing, especially the pressure up like The Onada is way pressured up than the other great legs. So that, that, that's really the bait. I still think I can win another one. Okay. I, I remember you fishing the Jacko Rocket at Oneida, um, and I told Tyler, like, th- what Kenna is doing is unbelievable. Just reading the articles about it, you're making a, a cast that lasts 10 minutes with a weightless, creepy, spider-looking thing on Baitcaster, and uh, it, it just absolutely blew my mind. So is is that a technique that you can use across the country, or is it purely like a more of a northern technique, clear water, the fish can see it, they can feel it better, and you just kind of have to sit and wait for them to come eat it? Okay, I honestly didn't want to talk too much about it because, I mean, you know, I, I only showed that in online, but... Actually, I caught a bigger swan in the Grand Lake, Grand Lake two years ago in the Auckland Lake in day one, which I had a 20, almost 22 pounds doing that. And also, I caught a lot of small mouths. I weighed in at the Lake Wheeler in this year at the Auckland, which that I was fishing just a you know, community hall where everybody is so, sort of shaky head at Rock Jetty. I pulled in there after five guys and still could have catch them on doing that. So, you know, and the only good thing is they don't sell here in the United States. So, you know, you feel <laughs> yeah. like, you know, well, I've we still can, got we a can bo- cut this whole out. box of it. <laughs> but I kind of I start to save it all that bait because, you know, people kind of ask me to <laughs> get me some, but <laughs> I, I had to keep it, keep it until the end of this year. Yeah. So were you, did you also use that bait um, at the Sabine? Because I thought I saw you on the last day of the Sabine throwing one of those weightless baits of some sort. And I didn't know if it was that exact same one, but I, I thought you were throwing it in those pilings there. Yes, it is. And I got one on doing that, but it wasn't really the perfect condition to do it. I, it was just a one of a tr- try thing. And I saw the one of the fish just right under the surface and uh, I didn't get, you know, that was a little fish, so they they wasn't very active at all. And I threw mm-hmm. my top water, they, he didn't want to touch it. I threw a Jago out there, which I could see on a live live scope, but you know, just couldn't. Could, they, he didn't hit the, my finesse wall either, so I saw pick it up in my Jago and caught caught one on the first shot. So that could have happened anywhere I'm going. And that would be the, my own fish, you know, what the, nobody else can catch. So when it when it comes to that bait, how what's your like? How do you work that thing? Because it is such a, I mean, it's a weightless presentation, you know. So you're casting it out, you know. So are you just are you is it just a slow drag pretty much across the bottom most of the time, or are you actually hopping it off and letting that thing fall? For the large mouse or flipping type of situation, I. My, I just make it or skip it, skip it or make cast and let him hit the bottom ones and pop it and let it go, let it go down again and pick it up. But about small mouse fishing, I was drifting with them. So it took me 10 minutes to hit the bottom and took another 10 minutes to get bite. But if you talk about you can catch a fish in every 20 minutes, it's a better than drop shot. It's such a slow presentation. Like, I don't even know. Like, it, it, it takes serious 
I don't know, stamina, like endurance just to fish that thing that slow? Probably mental endurance, yeah. Yeah. knowing that you're fishing this so slow. And I, I know the, the Jago rocket is, that's a, a Japanese, Japan-only bait. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of these baits come to market, uh, like the Cover Scat. I think Yamamoto has one. Are you working these type of like heavy soft plastics kind of the same as the Jago rocket or is that a completely different uh, type of bait or presentation? It's a, it's a pretty much different and uh, you know like a Yamamoto material of course it goes down a little quicker than other because it's heavier and the ca- cover scat is kind of in between you know kind of middle range it go it's not the fast as a Yamamoto material but it's a faster than Jaguar rocket. So it just really depends on, uh, you know, really depends on what you're fishing for. But to me, with that kind of presentation, I like to go to slower because it's a, if it's a faster, you can, you might be able to catch the same fish as a single, but with a, even a slower, some place the fish, you know, never even seen it because nobody can stand it but the bad part is you got to know where you where you got to make it where you got to cast because if you miss cast you're gonna waste 20 minutes <laughs> oh yeah some people say i like the cover skin and some people say i like the you know, model and, and to me it's a jaguar so that's the only difference in between yeah yeah you might be able to catch the same fish with a sanko but a different fish might not eat a Sanko, but it would eat the cover scat, the Yama Tanuki, the Jago rocket. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. And that's just, it's really just a, a totally different technique. Yeah. So what, I, I know you typically throw that on bait cast equipment. Do you also, what pound test do you throw that on? Do you do straight fluorocarbon? Yes, I do. And uh, here's a big key. I don't never use less than 16 pound test floral on that thing. You know, a lot of time I, I would go with 20, no matter how small fish you're fishing for, because that strain, the special floral carbon is extra weight. It's almost like a, you're doing a fry fishing. You know, you, you got to have mm-hmm. a little bit more weight than bait itself. So you're making about, you know, 100 yard cast. It's about another, you know, couple ounce of weight. That's how it works, right? Yeah, that's really interesting too because it's really it's finesse, but it's like power at the same time. Like it's 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 a finesse technique. It's weightless. It's fish extremely slow, but you're fishing it on heavy gear. I mean, like he said, sixteen pound yeah. is the least that he'll fish it on. And when we think a lot of times about, for example, smallmouth fishing, you know, we're talking about eight pound test being heavy i mean using six pound eight pound ten pound but this you know that the line for for these weightless baits adds a little bit more action it adds a little bit more weight allowing you to make that long cast allowing it to work a little bit better across the bottom so mm-hmm. that's just that that's one of those that's like that's some juice oh yeah super juicy and and that another thing i have to say is if you're fishing if you're fishing a Oneida or some of the Great Lakes, there's a zebra masses all over the bottom. Oh, yeah. That's another reason I have to go with a bigger line because you're making casts and let them sink for 20 minutes. Your line is completely scratching out the bottom. That's why you don't have to worry about the too big diameter because they can't see it anyway. So you're drop shotting with a pretty line, they can see the line, but with that way you're fishing, the line is completely on the bottom. Probably probably between the bait to the another pretty yard, you know, so you gotta have a big line. Gotcha. For sure. Okay, so we're talking about all of this I would say power fishing. Mm-hmm. We're talking about magnum square bills. We're talking about 20 pound test with weightless soft plastics. It seems like a maybe a misconception that Japan is all about ultra finesse, but here you are, Kenna, uh, talking about a lot of power fishing, big baits, heavy line. How did you 
or have you broken away from finesse fishing and you're purely utilizing these power fishing techniques? And over in Japan, especially like Biwa, where I grew up and, you know, where I sp used to spend 250 days in a year, that lake is, it's a big lake, you know, it's almost the same size as Lake Sinclair. So it's a big lake, but also we have almost 500 people every day on the water. So it's more, it's more pressured up than what it is in Gunnersville or some of the places in America. So of course you got to do some different wow. to fishing, you know, fishing for big fish. And to me, it's a big fish. Um, to catch a big fish, it, it is a power fish because, you know, I grew up with a lot, tons of hydro and stuff and really hard to do finesse. But, you know, like, like a person like Taku, some He's from a different part of the country, and he grew up in a you know small creeks or pond or small reservoir. And in that type of situation, we are, I mean, you, you know, he, he had it to grow up with a finesse fishing. So, you know, that's what makes a difference even between, you know, me and him. You know, makes a big difference in the way we're fishing. It's almost like a guy from California, you know, some guys from, you know, like... Uh, Clear like area, you know, they're big swim bait fishermen, and some guys from Delta, you know, they're more frog fishermen, and some guy from Lisbon, like Lake Mead, they're finesse fishermen. It's, it's almost the same way, you know, we we completely different type of fishermen, and you know, different different way to catch a big fish. So to me, the finesse is not the strong point. I mean, I I I still do a little bit, but. To me, I have more, you know, different white fish on the big swim bait or power side. Very interesting. Okay, so I think, have we covered kind of all the technique specifics? Let's dig deeper into Japan. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like Japan has really adopted bass fishing as a major sport. Um, it gets a lot of media coverage, but it, our I believe bass are considered to be invasive in Japan. How how has that transitioned into the big Japanese uh, tournament scene? Uh, for some reason, we are starting losing number of fish in the special past five six years, and you know the thing is kind of getting tougher and tougher every year. But but we still have the the bigger fish than ever. Like, especially in Lake Biwa, you know, like, they're not original species from the Lake Biwa, so of course they don't, the government don't want to be there with a the bass fishing, man. But the good thing is, I mean, I didn't realize in the first few years when they start killing the bass, but I figured what they do when they, when we start, since we start losing number, the bigger ones show up. Because each each of the fish can feed enough to grow up, you know, bigger than normal. So right now, I think like Bill has the best potential to break another one like oh, than ever been. So that's that's what the bright side we have. But about the tournament fishing, it's kind of getting smaller and smaller every year. So I think it it goes to the more like West Coast type deal. You know, people kind of hunting for bigger fish or either, you know, some little unique way. But, you know, I, I love the competition fishing. That's one of the reasons I'm here in the United States, trying to make a living on doing this. That's, that's really, uh, really interesting. Go ahead and ask it. Well, I, I don't know if it's the same question you have, but I'm very curious. Like, do you think that there is another world record swimming in Biwa right now? I do think so, or, you know, I haven't seen by my eye, because I I saw that wild like the fish when he caught, because he's one of my friends, and I wanted to see that fish, that fish was just as big as my, just as big as my body, <laughs> you know, that I, if I see that fish, I would say that, that was a six-footer, oh you know, gosh. that's how, how big he looked or was, but I still think that, that was like, 22 pound yep yeah is that what it was like all it was mm -hmm. 
And one of my customers caught 17 behind me in three years ago. Oh, wow. This is Dragon 10 XD. So there is more, you know, more fish than I could imagine. But we still don't know how to catch them up because them fish is, is a smart. I mean, it's not almost almost not the same species at all. You know, they can be thinking like a dog, you know. We are playing around as a cat, but, but dogs don't never care what we are doing. That's a yeah. kind of same type of situation. So they know what we are doing. And they know what type of it, what time of the a day we are coming out trying to catch them all. So we get a trick and somehow. Yeah, that's wild. Wild. You, and, and but it makes sense though if the largemouth bass population is becoming smaller and smaller in Lake Biwa, the bass that are in there have the capability to grow larger mm-hmm. just because of um, less demand on the food source mm-hmm. and w- what other species of fish are in lake biwa we do have uh, some own catfish species and uh, a lot of our own species over there but what makes the lake like biwa fish so big was in my opinion that was used to be a bluegill but now a lot of them wild like the crab fish are chasing for the, the either carp or trout so we have several species of that, and uh, I really think that's what they, you know, that's why they're growing up so quick and big. Are those are the the carp and the trout? Are those naturally reproducing in the lake? Are there any stocking programs uh, that they're utilizing? They do the both, especially the carp. You know, they they stocking and trying to, you know, that that's what commercial fishermen are catching. So that. I mean, that, that's a big, huge lake, so, you, you know, they can be producing, but they're also catching for eat. So, you know, they be producing and stuff like that. That's crazy. The The cool thing about that is that, like, if you look at a lot of the the, uh, the Californias, you know, the West Coast, where for, for a time, like, we, everyone thought the West Coast was going to be where the next world record was. And that was in particularly like during the 90s and that was because they started stocking um the f1 which is a a mix between a northern and a florida fish Mm -hmm. like in the 70s i believe i think it was the 70s and the 80s and during the 90s was when those fish started to hit the peak of their life which is why you saw so many of these giant fish in the 90s and in the 2000s but since then the the f1 when it spawns with another like say it spawns with a northern strain, it loses some in in the genetics. Or if it spawns with a pure Florida strain that's over there, it loses some of that genetics. Uh, Or even if it spawns with a known F1, it loses. And that's, they say the pure F1 was why those fish got so big. But you don't hear a lot about, you know, 18, 17, 19 pounders coming out of California like you used to. And and but it's interesting that you talk about it here. It, it, in my mind, it's like, yeah, I bet I bet he's right. You have a lake that that's the size of St. Clair that has few, not a ton of bass in it, and it has plenty of bait. I bet there is a, a world record, especially if you're catching a 17 pounder there in in the recent years. Oh, absolutely. Plus, add to that uh, that like Kenna said, these fish are smarter. Smart way smarter Mm -hmm. than what the fish are here and that's got to be because of angling pressure and probably the dynamic of what lake biwa actually is yeah so that's that's incredible yeah it's so interesting yeah i think i think something else that's really interesting that i've heard you 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 mentioned it earlier uh in the podcast but i kind of want to talk about it too with fishing because it kind of correlates with everything we've talked about is like you kind of say that like you either kind of have to be on uh, one side when it comes to picking out a lure, like you almost have to be on one side or the other. Like you have to be really small finesse or you have to be almost like really big, you know, like when we talked about the big crankbaits and stuff like that. And I, you know, I actually made a video uh, like last year where I talked about being on the extremes of fishing because everyone picks up a three eighths ounce chatterbait or a, a half ounce jig. That's kind of like what everyone picks up. But sometimes 
when you're on those extreme ends of the spectrum, really finessey or really big, that's what get those really pressured bites. And so I'm interested to hear kind of what your take is on that. Yes, that's true. And the reason why I say that, because, you know, like me, well, you know, there is like, we're usually fishing for at least six pounder or bigger fish. And, you know, them fish already has been pounded with a regular profile bait and any kind of bait in the market. So we almost have to try something they ever seen or something crazy like like you know the right now in like b1 it's definitely the finesse time finesse situation because we don't have as much as grass like used to so like you remember one of the dice baits the all speed dice baits that yeah. Kyoya was on at the seminal mm-hmm. that's one of the bait that people catch a lot of big one with a live scoping right now they just drop it right front of the face and joke it and let them eat it. So I, I you know, also don't ever done it in like you all because I didn't have to when I was fishing wild. But now it's how they catch a big one because so many, so many guys pounded that those fish was a big swim bait. And the about the big fish bait guys, I mean big swim bait guys are even going to bigger profile because you know like even two fifty profile is not the big enough to trick them. You know, everybody goes like three fifty or even bigger. So Jeez. that's a, that's how they're fishing that against the bigger fish and the pressure up like what's what's the smallest fish that you will catch on a like a two fifty profile swim bait? I mean, they're aggressive and, you know, like, especially the spawning time, and you can catch, like, two pounder on it. The smallest fish I ever done is two pounder. But, you know, every time I came over here in the United States, I'm just trying to understand what the pressure level they have. Like, in Lake Folk, they push it up, but not as much compared to, like, Biwa. So, I didn't, I didn't not, I figured I did not have to go that big or that small so that with my brain i can i always kind of think which level of a pressure they got in a big fish side <laughs> and you know to me you know like folk probably the big swim bait has to be i would say seven inch or bigger to trick them so to me it's a seven inch or if it's a springtime it could be a smaller so you're going uh, traveling to Japan, picking up uh, techniques that that they're using. They're using bigger swim baits, bigger swim baits. Have you brought anything from the United States to Japan that just absolutely knock their socks off? The Carolina rig, the Alabama rig. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. We had a the the big time air rig moment and. It's the same year as you guys did, but we couldn't get a rig from the United States, so we had to make one by itself. But in the yeah. first year, they they dominated anyone either. And, of course, pressured up quick, actually quicker than what it was in the United States, because we have, you know, so, so much limited fresh water in the... You know, every single fish has been caught in the first couple months, so it went out pretty quick. And but we realized how many fish we had left in the country, and since then I kind of you know started digging for some new stuff. You know, anything new, new things coming out, I'm not wasting my time to complain about. You know, because I know how it works in. Uh, you know, in, in this time, I just went back to home for a couple of weeks and spent about a couple thousand dollars for, you know, just a bait in Japanese, yeah. pay for the Japanese bait and bring them back because, you know, it usually only works for one of a ten. You know, I'm probably wasting about $1,900 was money. But, you know, if one thing works out and nobody else is on, that would be a big help for you know, elite level competition because, you know, everybody's good fishermen and everybody know what they're doing. And here, staying with the same bait wise or same weight fish, you know, 
I realize I can't win you any money in doing that. But I literally think, sure. you know, I have to have something in my own. And that, that's the way that he helps me out in the last two years, at least. Do you think that it takes one tournament to kind of give up a, a secret technique? Is it one tournament to reveal, okay, this is what's going on. Let's yeah. blow it up. And then everyone across the country, it just takes that one moment to, to right. identify I mean, that just, technique. Or just basically. a l- Lily depends how good you done it. I mean, you're on the live camera and win the tournament or either close to win, everybody will remember that. But, you know, you finish 10s or 9s and really not that many people pay attention actually have you know you're not making that money that much money on that tournament but you still would have some potential to redo it in the next tournament and a lot of time you know about that bait how to use it and how to leave it up ahead of everybody else so you know I would say yeah. probably it should have worked for two tournaments that's it I think I think it took Koya making one cast with the OSP dice rubber to open everyone's in the what? US's eyes of what in the heck is that? And then it was just yeah, a spending it gives us so much yeah. impact, you know, because the damn bait is so ridiculous looking. To me the dice was not the real original one. And I actually have a little bit different version of the same type of the bait which is which I call the Koike. It's a really original pine bowl type of bait that coming out in the ten years ago. And uh, I just offered them them guys to make a bigger profile, even though, like almost looks like C Archer that big one. Oh, yeah. And you know yes. people the baseball people kill them all over in Japan. I mean, it's not even looks like a fish or nothing. It looks like sea urchin, like that big round. Yeah. We cu- we caught them good over in home, and I brought it back in here in the United States, and still look for where to throw. I d- I didn't never catch fish yet, but I I I'm I'm pretty sure I can catch it somewhere when we go to maybe somewhere in the fresh up lake, or it could it be a gunner's bill? That's crazy. So. Do you think it, it's just some of those crazy techniques are just so, and not that they're crazy, but the techniques and the baits, they're so unique. They're so situational to where you have to have the most ideal situation to use those baits and to be successful with those baits. Are, what are the most kind of diverse baits that you can use in different conditions, different water qualities, water color that you still consider to be, you know, unique uh, that are from Japan. I don't know if you have seen it, that what the Koya was thrown in that tournament at Seminole. I was kind of kind of scared he makes the that bait too famous over in the United States or either <laughs> how He's shown it too much about the that bait too famous here in the United States is the four point eight inch profrad, which a lot of people already know it, but mm-hmm. really don't know how to use it. And actually I caught a lot of the big one on like Dior I mean like Dior and also the like you followed this year and uh what else? I mean I I've been catching on that bait anymore. I'm going, but Liddy kind of, you know, kind of has to slow, slow the bait down, slow fall, or either you have to swim in that thing to catch them all. So I was kind of, kind of wanting about, you know, if people get too excited about bullfrog, but I, I'm actually happy they, they're consoling on the dice bait, so. Yeah, and I think the dice rubber is so outrageous and out there. Uh, just enough to kind of turn people off of using it. And hopefully maybe the bowl flat 
Um, I know the 4.8 size is, I, I mean, that's a big bait. Mm -hmm. And I think Koya was uh, like flipping boat docks with it. But that might be just, just that big enough of profile of bait to turn a lot of people off. But it goes along with exactly what you're talking about with the, the Evoke 4.0 to where in a heavier pressure situation, you either go micro baits or go oversized baits. Yep. And from what I'm hearing from Kenna and looking at his tournament success, it seems like going oversized bait is the way to go yeah. to be m more of a successful angler. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, Kenta, I also have, I have a, I have a question. Um, that's it's, it's maybe a little bit, uh, I, I'm just curious to know your you have you have had a lot of success. You've been on the elites for two and a half years now, and you and you've done yeah. great. But you fished the opens, and you did really well in the opens. And you continue, like CJ said in the beginning of this, you continue to do really well in the opens. Like you've had some, you know, you you won an open here. Uh, what was that last year? Um, you you've yeah. had second places, several of them, and. For guys who haven't fished the open levels tournaments, like one thing that I know when I fished them that I struggled with is like there there's people fishing everything. Like you, it's hard to it's hard to kind of find some stuff to yourself at times in those tournaments. And so my question to you is like what how, what is your approach to the open events when you go to an open and there's 200 to 225 anglers? Do you try to find stuff off the beaten path or do you just try to just fish your strength and go out there and just not even like, you know, take into consideration all the pressure that that lake's getting? Okay. To me, for the open is kind of, kind of practice process and halfway just to practice, mm -hmm. practice for open mind because, you know, I, when I was just an open fisherman, I you know, I, I could have just, uh, you know, long day practicing, I mean, long practicing and find a spot to fish and just trying to figure out about my knowledge about the lake and stuff. But since I made it the lake in the fishing, I figured it's not the way to do, you know, because I'm competing with a more adjustment guy. And the guys usually catching decent on day one and catching even more on day two and I was not that level in the first year when I was a rookie so I figured I have to you know change completely change it up completely and restart it the way I'm fishing competition so to me you know you know about entry fee wise it's like forty five hundred dollars in elite series and I'm pretty scared to be open mind you know you have to have at least some you know something to keep doing it but in the open i don't have you know i'm not on the point of lace at all i'm just fishing you know trying to make money or even win one so what i'm doing is mm -hmm. i'm never trying to figure them up the detail on the lake or never trying to find out the two D, you know, just a just a kind of giving a enough idea and practice. Just going easy, easy and practice and come in tournament day, just just go fishing, you know, and that, that that's the way it literally works out in the last two years. And uh, you know, that makes me have uh, so much idea how to do it in the elite stage. So yeah, I li that that's one of the reasons I keep doing it in the open, no matter how. Yeah, that's super. That's super good, and I think that that's a reoccurring thing that at least I pick up on from a lot of guys is you don't you don't want to really dial it in in practice. You really want to kind of just get a few details and really expand upon it during the tournament. Um, I think mm -hmm. for for a lot of opens anglers, especially like myself, like all you can think about a lot of times is qualifying for the elites. And so you put so much pressure on yourself that you feel like you have to figure it out. Like you have to, you have to like have a solid game plan. And, you know, some of my worst, some of my best tournaments in the opens, I had really rough practices. And the thing about a rough practice where you're not figuring a thing, a lot out is you do keep an open mind come tournament time. You, there's nothing that you're afraid to do because you're like, well, nothing else has worked. 
But it's so hard, even if you do kind of figure something out in practice, to keep an open mind during those tournaments when there's money on the line, when there's elite series berth on the line. So that's just something that me, I know personally, like I, I'm really going to try to work on when I go back to the opens. But I just love hearing your your input on that. And what you say makes perfect sense, again, because it's like, you know, you, you just want to get a little bit of detail here and there. But really, when it comes to the tournament, you you kind of really just go with uh, what you're feeling in the moment, which is really, really hard to do. Um, but it's it's what makes you a good angler. That's exactly, you know, like I used to be in the calling group in a back in a long time ago. And uh, when I was a drill out, it was Michael Canale who was at the Potomac River. I mean, that was that was he was a fishing completely different back then. I believe that was back in 2005. That was the first one he won in the FAW Tour. And I was day two call angler. And, I mean, he... I know where he caught him on day one, but... I, I, now I understand what he was trying to do. He was trying to get used to with, you know, open mind and it changed up and changed up during the tournament day. Because it used to be in the back in the long time ago, you know, everybody else was uh, just locked up on something, and Kevin Van Damme was pretty much only one says so open mind and kick kick everybody's block, you know. So I, I figured, you know, Ike was changing, and that day he was changing, like, his decision about at least six, seven times, just changed up and changed up, doing a completely different and he ended up to win that tournament in the last hour. Well, that was one of the juiciest podcasts yet, but these techniques won't work well if you don't know where the bass live. And in this podcast right here, we talked to a local biologist all about a bass tracking study that was done on Lake Erie. It was extremely cool. And if you guys enjoyed this video, I think you will enjoy this one as well. Please subscribe, comment below, and I'll see you guys in the next one.